Welcome to our daily devotion. The Methodist Church of Barbados invites you to sing, pray, and worship with us as we declare God's glory and celebrate His mighty acts. Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening in the precious name of Jesus. Father, we worship and praise your holy name. O Lord, our Lord, the majesty and glory of your name covers the earth and fills the heavens. O Lord, our God, each morning's sunrise and evening sunset show us that this is indeed the world you created. We gather now in this hour, Lord, to worship you with our hymns and psalms and words of praise. We thank you, Father, for your love. Unworthy though we are, you shower your blessings upon us. 
Thank you for the gifts of nature, for family and friends, for your protection and your grace. But most of all, Father, we thank you for the gift of Jesus, for forgiveness from sins, for the hope of eternal life, and for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Father, you have been so good to us. Your mercies never fail. They are new every morning. But so often, Lord, we grieve your Holy Spirit when our thoughts, our words, and our actions are not in keeping with being children of God. Forgive us, Father, for our shortcomings. We are sorry for our sins. Forgive us and help us to do better. Help us, Father, to live so that those around us, whether in our homes, our workplaces, our schools, or our communities, we pray that they may see Jesus in us and we want to make you their God because of our example. Father, in our world tonight, there are so many people who are hurting in so many different ways. We bring them all to you. Father, you promise that if we walk with you, if we trust and believe that you are God and that Jesus, your son, died to take away our sins, you promise, Lord, that you will never forsake us in our hours of need. And so, Father, we stand on your promises. We pray, Lord, that you will look upon those hurting tonight. May they feel your presence, giving them peace and comfort, strength and courage to face what lies ahead. Father, we bring our country Barbados to you. We pray that your name will be reverenced and worshipped all over this nation. We pray, Father, that men and women, boys and girls, will come to worship you and accept Jesus as their Savior. Father, we pray that the plans of the evil one for our nation will come to naught and that the spirit of love and kindness will prevail in our nation. Dear God, bless this act of devotion tonight. We pray that it will bring honor and glory to your name and that we, your children, will receive the blessing. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior and our friend. Amen and Amen. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His groaning Of His precious blood's atoning then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me My love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again. And caused the blind to see And then I cried Dear Jesus Come and heal my broken spirit And somehow Jesus came and brought To me the victory Oh, victory in Jesus my Savior forever He sought me And bound me With His redeeming blood He loved me ere I knew Him And all my love is due Him He plunged me To victory 
beneath the cleansing flood I heard about a mansion He has built for me in glory And I heard about the streets of gold Beyond the crystal sea Oh, about the angels singing And the old redemption story And some sweet day I sing up there The song of victory Oh, victory in Jesus My Savior forever He sought me and bought me With His redeeming blood He loved me My love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. The reading is taken from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God. To present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. This is the word of the Lord.
pray. Transforming God. We fix our eyes upon you tonight, recognizing that without you, we remain in our lost state. We thank you for your Holy Spirit upon whom we depend to change our lives. May these words shared arouse a response in some heart, God, not for our glory, but that your name will be glorified. So remove now any form of self and shine through. Shine through God the hearts and minds of your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present to your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Romans 12, 1 to 2. Paul's epistle of Romans was directed to the church at Rome as a means of his introduction to them to give them an overview of the gospel and to direct them as to the type of living expected of believers. In this book comprising his letter to that church from chapters 1 to 11 Paul teaches the doctrine of the gospel regarding God's mercy in Christ that saves us in spite of our imperfection. From chapter 12, Paul switches from his theological teaching found in those 11 chapters to his practical teaching. Here he emphasizes godly living, having relationship with God and man. His Paul is informing us that we must translate our learning into living to show by our daily lives that we trust God through our body, mind, and will. Paul seems to be implying that he had taught the people all about God's expectation, and now he is admonishing them to do something about what they've heard or learned. The first two verses of our reading of Romans 12, 1 to 8, which form our text, serve as a summary statement of all the other verses that follow. First, Paul starts this section of the letter by making an appeal. I appeal to you. It is not unusual for Paul to make such requests that arouse a sympathetic response. For instance, he used the word appeal Later in chapter 15, verse 10, when he asked the believers to join him in earnest prayer to God to rescue him from the unbelievers in Judea. He used appeal to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 1.10 as he made a demand for unity among the believers. Paul used this word to Philemon as he pleaded on behalf of Onesimus. And here he makes this appeal, or passionate request, to the church at Rome to practice Christian living. Of note also is the use of the word therefore indicating that his message here is a result of what transpired before. Once we hear that word therefore, we know that something preceded which led to the upcoming consequence. In this case, it is the teaching that went before. Paul taught and now he expects action. Note also that through the appeal, Paul makes a demand of the believers by the mercies of God to present their bodies as living sacrifices. The concept of offering sacrifice originated in the days of the Israelites when the animals were killed and sacrificed 
as an offering to God, and the type of animal use varied depending on the type of offering. Of course, today there is no more offering up of animals since an offering was made to God on man's behalf over 2,000 years ago, the sacrificial lamb, which is Jesus, to which we are now expected to respond, the one who was crucified and raised again. Are we glad for that offering? Oh, yes. The Old Testament sacrifices were dead, and Paul is emphasizing that God wants believers as living sacrifices, not like those old dead sacrifices. That is, God wants us giving our all to him while we are living and moving and having our being in him. Paul implies that there must be dedication of our bodies to God, not to man, and that we dedicate them as we aim for holiness and to be acceptable to God which is our spiritual worship or our way of living. Dedication is the giving of our entire self, our thoughts, our emotions to God. Paul seems to be saying that since we have been the recipients of God's mercies, we are to be living sacrifices to God in reciprocation, that we owe it to God to respond that God wants us to surrender while we are alive. He wants us to relinquish the control of our lives to him, to let go and allow God to take charge. Also to, to become free of the blemishes, as in the case of the animals that were offered in the days of the Israelites. Yes, presenting ourselves to God, involves in trusting ourselves him, placing ourselves at his disposal voluntarily. Each individual takes care of offering himself or herself. We cannot offer anyone else. The Christian journey is, is a journey of sacrifice. It is not easy. There are many times when we have to forego our right or give way in order to allow peace to reign. There are many times when, as the older people will say, we have to bite our tongue in order to see God's face. There are many times when we have to appear to play the part of a fool in order to reconcile. I am sure many of you can identify with these occasions. Paul is suggesting that as part of our relationship with God, we surrender or submit ourselves to God through service. According to 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, the Christian body is the temple of God. And in this respect, Romans 8, 9, as because the spirit of God dwells within Therefore, for us, it ought to be a privilege to glorify and magnify God through our body, to use our bodies to the glory of God in whatever we do, as 1 Corinthians 10.31 states. He said, whether we eat or whether we drink, whatever we do, the glory is God's. So just as Jesus, the perfect illustration of a living sacrifice, offered his body in obedience in order to accomplish the Father's will on earth, so we must yield and surrender to Christ that we might continue God's work through us. Note that when we present ourselves to God, we do so once and for all. It's a definite commitment. We say until death do we part. Paul follows this appeal to surrender with a caution though. He says, do not be conformed to the world. And the word conform means adapted or intimidated. Yes, Paul warns against being conformed 
to the world as you are aware it is natural for man to be governed by what happens in the world from birth we are influenced by our surroundings as we grow we continue to follow the worldly behaviors influenced by sin and we continue to keep up at times with friends and loved ones or we keep up with the majority although there are times when from the heart we prefer not to be included but the influence is so great that we succumb today too many christians allow the world to dictate their pace too many allow the world to set the standards for us too many comply with the world's leading and do not stand up and stand out for righteousness often god's standards are no longer the guide for us we become so inundated with what the world has to offer that we no longer make our own decisions based on God's standards or biblical standards. We no longer set our own pace based on the biblical dictates. We no longer live by right and wrong before God, but we fall in that gray line. But my friends, do not be conformed. Not only does Paul caution us not to be conformed to the world, but he directs us to be transformed, to discern God's will. He wrote, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That's verse 2 of Romans 12. The word transform is derived from the Greek of metamorphosis, which means to change form. It is often used when describing a change from a caterpillar stage to a butterfly. Of course, we know that's a beautiful and enhanced change. We understand that this said Greek word was used in the transfiguration of Jesus on the mount, according to Matthew 17. Hence, just as Jesus was transformed, so we too ought to be transformed, all for the service of God. And according to the Nelson's Bible Dictionary as well, transformation is a radical change in inner character, condition or nature hence it happens on the inside and is reflected on the outside so my friends transformation is not only physical it's a mental it's a spiritual change one who's transformed has a thought structure that is different our attitude towards jesus christ changes we yield entirely to him and we dedicate ourselves to fill the road role that God has planned and assigned us within the body of Christ. Paul is saying that when we are transformed, our thinking is changed from old and ungodly ways of thinking into new godly ways. Death of the old ways has taken place. He wrote in 2 Corinthians 5 17. So if anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Of course, a common belief is that our actions reveal our heart. If the experts view that we become what we think is correct, it means that if we think Jesus, we become like him. If we fill our minds with the positive, we live positively. If we fill our minds with the negatives of the world, we live negatively. Thus, we allow ourselves then to join that negative bandwagon. 
So, for example, when we spend hours watching negative shows, we are feeding our minds with negativity. When we spend every moment involved in negative discussions or harping on negative behaviors, we are occupying our thoughts negatively. And the more time we spend on the negative, the less we have to spend on the positive. And hence, the less time we have to spend with God. So yes, Christians are called to live this transformed life that is different from non-Christians, which as I said earlier, is not easy because replacing the world's way of thinking can only be done through the help of God's Holy Spirit. Renewing our minds as he reveals God's desire. And through this change or renewed mind, we have the ability to discern the will of God in our lives and to prove God's will is good and acceptable and perfect. And we do so through as we undertake the ministries in the body of Christ with a transformation through a renewed mind. Then there, there are times when we have to say no, when everybody else is saying yes, we have to stand out. Importantly, though, is that as we become transformed, we no longer consider ourselves more highly than we ought to be, says verse 3. We are humble. We recognize that we are all sinners and fallen short of the glory of God, according to Romans 3.23. As we are transformed in humility, we use those gifts given according to the grace. We spend more time on godly nourishment, studying and living the word, making it part of our daily living and sharing it, praying and listening to God, being in fellowship with God's people, learning and building up each other. So listeners, as Methodists celebrate the month of October as Ministry Month, I want to encourage us to yield to the words of the Apostle Paul. Let us respond first individually to Paul's appeal so that our efforts will cascade within the body of Christ. Let us allow God's Holy Spirit to transform us by the renewing of our minds so that we are not conformed to this world and its influence as we sacrifice our entire being for Christ's sake. As we aim to know and discern God's will, let us commit to the studying and sharing of the word, to prayer, to regular fellowship, and to the offering of our gifts within the body of Christ. I urge us all not to wait to be asked, but to offer ourselves to the ministry of the church as we discern and fulfill the will of God. Amen. I hear the Savior say Thy strength indeed is small Child of weakness, watch and pray Find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all All to him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain
Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Let us pray. God, we have heard your word, your word which is a light to our path. We've heard Paul's appeal for us to act. I pray, oh God, that this word finds its place within the hearts of your people. May we move away from the world and its attractions and focus on things eternal. May we accept and use the gifts granted to us for the edification of your kingdom. You, God, have been gracious to us. Teach us to respond lavishly. And as we continue as a church to celebrate this ministry month, Open avenues for those offering themselves to any type of ministry. Clear any block pathways that would inhibit their progress. Whether financial, whether health, family, or otherwise. God, you've done it before and we know you will do it again. So hear my prayer, which I offer 
on behalf of all of us and in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. for being a part of our daily devotion. We trust it has been a blessing to you. Now together, let us hold fast to his word and may it dwell in all of us richly.